to all of you joining my little presentation. I think I will need about 15 minutes. Um, yeah, the topic is provenance against uh, as a protection against manipulations. And we have talked a lot about provenance, but just let us repeat what is provenance? What is my understanding of a provenance, of a philatelic provenance? And um, I would say, in short, it's the knowledge about a former ownership or the former owner of an item, or better said, in what collection was a certain item part of? And where was it offered? Um, this gets especially interesting when we have an illustration available from the time the item was offered, let's say in a 1930, 1950 or 1990 auction catalog with all the photo plates. And this give us, gives us the chance to compare an item with the uh, quality or with the, the illustration of today or the, the item of today with the illustration in the past. And in many, or in some cases, we see difference, especially when an item has been manipulated. And this is what I want to show you um, with a few examples. So any manipulations that can have been done on an item over the last few or many years or decades could be either a margin has been added or a perforation has been reperforated or a cover has been restored. A stamp may have been replaced on a cover. An unused stamp may have been regummed. Or we have some other manipulations. And for all of these, I would like to show you some examples. Let's go first to the added margins. So I show you a nice penny black from Mint from plate eight lettered KD. Wonderful margins all around and it couldn't be nicer. Interesting, we have from plate eight another single penny black the neighboring stamp lettered KC and also with full margins. And what I could find in my card index in my census, I could also find a stamp, a single stamp lettered KB, the left hand neighboring stamp, but not as nice margined as the two others. But going more into detail, you will see that the three stamps I showed you as singles that has been offered over the last 20 years originally formed a mint strip of three, which has been cut into singles and the two stamps, KC in the middle and KD on the right, have been repaired and the margin has been added. Good to know how the original uh, quality of the item of the strip of three was. Another, another example is this block of four of the penny black. And to go to, to, to grab into the card index, to grab into the past, we will find the same block offered on a former auction, but illustrated when it was in a damaged status. Here we have a nice, another nice penny black mint from the bottom of the sheet with sheet margin. It looks beautiful, but when we know where it comes from, um, that it was originally the right hand stamp, the very damaged right hand stamp from a, a strip of three, we can see that the entire bottom right corner is completely rebacked and uh, added. So if, if you have this stamp as a single TK, 
on your table and you're being asked, then we know by finding the strip of three what the true quality of the stamp must be. It is repaired. Another beautiful block of the Tuppence Blue from 1840. And we have large regular margins all round, but also interesting to look how it was originally preserved. So the, uh, I have mostly only black and white uh, illustrations in my card index because uh, many of the illustrations come from auction catalogs in the 1970s, 1960s, 1950s. And in these days, um, the stamps were mainly on the photo plates illustrated in black and white. Let's have a, a nice example or an interesting example of reperforations. This is the three pence from 1862. And this is a so-called abnormal plate with the secret dots on the left and on the right hand side, which is the, uh, the characteristic for plate three. And plate three has only been printed possibly five sheets. So we have a very nice three pence, but the question is, is the perforation original, original or is it manipulated? Interesting to find that the stamp is originally the right hand stem from a horizontal pair with nearly cut with a cut margin at the top and um, cut by Skissos perforations at the bottom. So the stamp is identical. The pair that was existing until the 1960s has been split into singles. The right hand stamp letter, the BF in the lower corners has been reperforated at the bottom and at the top. And just to prove that it is indeed the original stamp You can see that the perforation on the right is still the original perforation and untouched. You see all the characteristics. It is interesting to know if you go, or let's say it is interesting if you go into the card index, into the, in the, into the census, what about the other stamps from the B row? from the so-called abnormal and very rare plate three. And we see another stamp letter BC. And again, we have the reperforation at the top and at the bottom. We can even put all the stamps recorded from the B row together and we will find out that practically all stems from the horizontal B row from this rare plate three have defective or cut by Skissers perforation at the top. So we have here now BB, BC, BD, all neighboring stems, the pair BE and BF with what we started and BG, BJ, and BH. And you can see the perforation obviously was faulty at the top and most of the stems have then later cut the perforations by Skissos. Another reperforation, another interesting example is the mint one pound with the watermark Maltese cross, one of the rarest stamp of Great Britain, possibly 40, 45 mint singles known. This looks superb, but knowing what the original quality was of the perforation, we see that an old time illustration from an auction catalog shows two short or missing perfs 
on the left hand side. Perfectly repaired. Cover restoration. So comparing old illustrations in auction catalogs, we find that, for example, um, the one shilling green, the 1847 issue, we have a small part of a cover illustrated in an Robson Law auction catalog in the 1940s. You can see 19 stamps on front, on reverse, or what we can see from the photo. And from the 19 stamps, nine are being affixed on the flap, on the reverse. And when the cover was opened by the sender, one stamp, which was affixed over the cover flap, has been torn. In later years, we see the cover in another auction with the torn stamp at the top left now repaired. Possibly the missing half of the stamp was still affixed on the other part on the reverse. Nevertheless, interesting is that just two or three years ago, the cover came again on the market but for reasons unknown, now it was this described by the auction house that it was not a 19 shilling postage cover. Now it is only a nine shilling cover and the two vertical strips of five on the front have been taken off. Unfortunately, I don't have a illustration of the front, but none of the uh, cancellations are tied to the front, to the address front. And now it is, it has been reduced from a 19 shilling franking to a nine shilling franking and looks quite nice. Now replacing of stamps. This uh, is quite, can happen quite often. And I show you one nice example this is the 1840 Tuppence Blue, and this was used from Manchester on a cover to Kendall to the best bank of Westmoreland. And in Manchester, it was cancelled and tied to the entire by the so-called local Manchester Fishtail Maltese Cross. A wonderful cover, but Going into my census, in the, into the card index, we see that formerly the stamp lettered SJ, which was, which is on the cover, was offered about 20, 25 years ago as a single off cover. And the interesting question is, what was originally on the cover? And also, Going back about 30 years, you find the cover, exactly the same cover. At the first glance, you, you would believe it's the same stamp, adhesive stamp. In fact, it isn't. The stamp, or, uh, there was originally on the cover a stamp lettered NJ, and it was slightly cut into at the top. So NJ has been taken from the cover and as SJ, another stamp, has been affixed on the cover. I must say this is extremely difficult to detect because the uh, cancellation is nearly identically struck on the, on the stamps, but nevertheless, the stamp has been changed, NJ has been taken off, SJ has been affixed on the cover. Regumming. So here we cannot work only with old time illustrations from auction catalogs. Regumming means we have also to check the descriptions of the auction houses when the stamps were offered in the past. 
Let's start with the 1840 Tuppenny Blue, played one. A nice single lettered NH and was described with original gum. We find another single which was formerly most likely attaching to NH, the neighboring stamp, also with or described with original gum. And from the same row, with just missing NJ in between, another single stamp, mint with original gum, was offered. But at the end of the day, it is interesting to see what they originally were. In fact, they once formed in the 1950s a slip of four. And interesting enough, the slip of four was originally described by unused without gum. So it has been split into singles and then regummed. Or it has first been regummed and then split into singles. This we don't know. Nevertheless, the gum on the singles cannot be original. Another example is this unused pair of the penny black. It's from plate six and is offered with original or was offered with original gum. Interesting that it seems that the pair was part of this famous block of nine. And can it be that the upper row of three stamps has been cut from the block of nine? Who on earth will split a wonderful corner block of the penny, blade, penny black plate six? By the way, this was always described without gum. And indeed, we find in later years the block of nine reduced to a block of six. The block of six is still without gum, but the upper pair is cut from the block of nine and has been regummed. Various manipulations, the one or another or another example, and this is uh, one of the, the, the most challenging um, examples for manipulation. What we see here is a penny red used on a cover to Trieste. Trieste was Austria. The reason why the penny red on the cover, it has been used on the cover is not clear. The cover has been text or has been paid in advance with, I think it, this is one shilling seven pence. And it may or may not have been that the penny red was paid for late fee. You can see that the penny black shows the O floor, which is a, uh, a characteristic for the penny red from the black plate 10. And I was informed by a good friend that this cover, not the cover is fake, but that the stamp on the cover originally did not belong. So I thought, if the stamp did not belong, then it must have been existing as a mint stamp. And finally, I was able to find a pair which incorporated the stamp JH unused. Now the question is, how can it be proved that the unused, that the pair has been split, that the unused stamp has been affixed on the cover and has been canceled with a faked Maltese cross. And by comparing the mint single, sorry, the mint pair or the unused pair, it was without gum, with the stamp on the cover, you see on the forehead or in front of the crown of the queen, 
you see on the mint stamp a black mark. And the black mark is still there in front of the, of the queen's crown on the used stamp. When the pair has been split and the single JH has been affixed on the cover, in the bottom right, the margin has been changed a little by Skissos, otherwise it is ex absolutely identical. So thank you for your attention, following me uh, through some examples for what the knowledge of provenance, the comparing of uh, illustrations from today and from the past, what benefit can be in provenances? Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. That was so, so interesting. And um, would anyone like to ask Carl any questions? You can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can just pop, pop it in the chat box. I think Carl's got a few minutes to answer some questions. Yes, of course. Thank you. And if any questions uh, will raise uh, later, so you will find me at the booth of Corin Fila and Köhler. Carl, oh, this is Carlos from Madrid. Hello, Carlos. Hey, look, um, with, with the improvements of technology, yes. I am assuming that digital ar archives can be made. Um, yes. And uh, I'm assuming that this is going to become a, a useful tool for people to follow these kind of things. Yes. But it, we will require the cooperation, of course, of the auction houses, of the, of the um, philatelic associations, and, and, and even possibly the, um, um, the, uh, the traders at, at large. But how do you think, do you think is what can be done or what is it that, um, that, that, that has already been perhaps engaged in, in, this, in this area? The question whether it should be traditional on paper stored, such uh, card indexes or sensors of stamps, or digitally on a computer. When I started my card index, which is uh, in the background of me with about 100,000 index cards now, um, I didn't have a chance to um, decide whether digitally or on traditionally on paper because in the late 1980s, the storage capacities of computers were by far not large enough to store so many illustrations. So this would have been possible, let's say from possibly nine, two, from 2000 on or 2005. But then I had already 50 or 60,000 index cards and the, doing the um, census or the card index on digitally on a computer would have meant in 2000 or 2005 to start again from scratch. And unfortunately, I only have one life. So I continue to do it on or very traditionally and physically on index cards. On the other hand, I must say in 2006, when I took over management of Corinfila in Zurich, I started from scratch a similar card index, a similar census for uh, classic Swiss philately. And I was thinking at least four weeks about whether to start digitally on a computer or traditional on paper. And after four weeks, after 30 sleepless nights, I decided to put it on index cards. And finally, I think the decision was absolutely right. So the reason why I decided for index cards on paper was they cannot be stolen. If you have it digitally and somebody breaks into your computer or gets access without control, um, you lose, you don't lose, you still have it, but it will be copied within a few minutes, few sticks, few minutes, then it's gone. And you have invested, I can tell you, at Corinfila, we have invested at least 50 to 60,000 Swiss francs to build up the card index register for, uh, for Switzerland. So the investment was in, in manpower. I have a student doing this for me. 
So, and you cannot take out all the, the boxes with the cards from the company or from the office. So this is for security. But then I had, a, I had an experience with a customer and um, when I showed him my card index, he thought he had, he had viewed all the lots he wanted to see from the auction. I said, uh, did you see uh, this lot and this lot? He said, no, I don't need it. I said, I'll show you how rare it is. And I'll show you with some examples from my card index. Ah, what is your card index? So, and um, it was, uh, I think it was half past one at lunchtime. And finally, my customer left the office at 9.30 in the evening. And so we had so much fun playing with the index cards in my office in Zurich. So you're right asking, shouldn't we do this on digitally on a computer? I say yes, but you can only start with new, with a new census. You, you, you cannot put all this, what we have, it, it would make no sense, but Possibly today, if I would start another another collecting field with a card index and a census, I would start on a computer, yes. Thanks, Carl. Very useful, very interesting. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask Carl a question? We've got a few more minutes. Yeah, Carl, it's Paul Davey in the UK. Hello, Paul. Uh, just out of interest, do you find that, um, some of the lots in older auction catalogues you can actually trace back and they've been manipulated in the in the 30s and 40s no my impression is that the manipulations mainly took place in the 1980s 1990s and after 2000 i have very very few items which i can prove that they have been repaired or manipulated before 1970 very, very few. Okay. I have to think about. But in these days, let's say 50, 50 years ago, quality was not such a topic as it is today. Today, topic uh, quality is nearly everything beside rarity. But um, the, the gap, the price gap, the, the, the gap of the value between slightly damaged and perfect quality. Yep. The, the gap is, has, been grow, has been increased year by year by year by year and got larger. And this has motivated people to manipulate damage stamp and to make good, let's say, to repair them, to make them looking perfect. Make them more commercial. Yeah, <laughs> this happens, but uh, also, it's not only commercial, but I know also stamp collectors who didn't like a damaged stamp or a damaged cover in their collections. They send it in for, for, for repair and then reintegrate it in their collection. It is not only the trade. I must say it was not always the trade. Does this answer your question, Paul? It does. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Paul. That was excellent. Um, does anyone? Oh, um, is there um, any other um, questions for Carl? Brilliant. Well, um, as Carl mentioned earlier, he will be back on um, the Corin Filler booth this afternoon, and he'll yep. be back with us in the uh, collector's lounge tomorrow, I believe. <laughs> yes, you, and Carl. again about provenances, but this under the topic of philatelic importance, how provenances may help us to uh, value philatelic importance. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Carl. That was excellent. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.